You are the God of all creation. God, you're from everlasting to everlasting. The psalmist said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And yet in your word, you have ground us with honor. You have created us in your image. And so it's above all the creation and under you. This morning, Father, we joyfully humble ourselves under you. And we invite you, God, according to your word, according to your promise, to come in and join us in this time. And God, that your presence would be greater than every other thing. That you would receive honor and glory and praise. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All righty. Well, here is our verse from last week. Anybody want to be bold and, and uh, say, I'm going to quote that right out loud? Now, you see, Marge, I saw you. You did this. It was so close. It was so close. I, I'll give you a pass. Let's say it together. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Ephesians 6, 13. Here's the one for today. This is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. Let's say it together. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. Let's say that again. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. One more time, just for good measure. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. <laughs> Very good. I want to take a moment. <clears throat> and uh, just before I invite uh, Charlie up, by the way, he says he goes by Charlie, not Charles. He only goes by Charles if he's in trouble. And so I know that feeling. I went by Al I went by James Allen a lot back in my day. Anyway, um, but before we do that, I want to take a moment, a few moments here actually, and we're going to divide this up. Uh, I'm going to share some things. Then I'm going to invite Charlie to come, and then I'm going to come back and share a few things from the Word. But we are going to be mindful. He, he's promised me he's going to try to keep it, you know, and I'm going to try. But you know how it goes. All right. Uh, this morning, I would like to, um, we're going to do something of, uh, the Bible talks about honoring those who uh, are worthy, who preach and teach the gospel, and honoring others. The Apostle Paul did so in his epistles. And so on Heritage Sunday, we are going to remember some folks. And being as it's been quite some time since he was around, I'm going to ask Mary Jane to go to our first slide. Here are some folks who um, many years ago were members of the church and were also Gideons, <laughs> Alvin and Christine Griffin. Uh, Alvin passed in May of 1990, and I, uh, I had started in 89, but I didn't come full-time until June, and he passed in that May, but he and Christine were very faithful in the Gideons and Christine for many years. I was going to tell you the story about I attend the Gideons banquets because one year something came up and I, I wasn't able to attend the Gideons banquet. They invite the pastors of churches to come. And one year I couldn't go. And the next Sunday, Christine Griffin looked at me with a kindly smile and that look that she gave her kids and says, I expect my pastor to be at that banquet. I haven't missed one since. <laughs> uh, Paul and Madeline Dory, Richard and Ray Fowler. Uh, Richard actually had cases and cases of Bibles that he stored at his house. At times they would be doing Bible blitzes, things like what they're doing this week at um, the uh, State Fair. And Bob and Betty Van Dyke. Uh, Betty is still with us. Bob, unfortunately, only lived a short time, but was very active with the Gideons. And why do we donate to the Gideons? <laughs> because it was Pastor Duke's favorite Christian charity. Um, because, well, he, one of his sons, Ross, 
who I didn't list Ross because he was not a member of our church, but Ross used to be our speaker for many years. And it was, um, Pastor Dukes always said, what else can you do better with your money than buy Bibles? And uh, I'm in uh, agreement with that. All right. Um, now, uh, I'm going to have to step forward here. And, actually, I'm going to jump up here where I can see that. It says, in the early days, there were several women who were meeting in their homes for a Bible study. That was where the idea for the church in Oak Orchard began. They asked Silas Dukes of Laurel, Delaware, a lay preacher, if he would be their pastor. They began to meet in the Oak Orchard Firehouse and proceeded to build a church in 1964. Hmm. Actually, I think it, they began to meet, and the church itself was dedicated in 65, but that's pretty close. On land purchased from Eugene Bookhammer, who gave one lot for each lot purchased. The funds for the church and the land came from the church members. As the area began to grow, so did the church. And in 1973, the current sanctuary where you're sitting now was added. Again, funds and some of the labor came from the members of the church. Silas Dukes was pastor from 1964 to 1996 when the Lord took him home. Pastor James Allen Miller, that'd be me, uh, took over and remains pastor today. There were others who helped pastor, uh, who helped the pastor. Lynn Moore, who came the first Sunday of every month for 25 years uh, and assisted Pastor Dukes, along with Dave Kaiser, Dave Rosen, and Charles Williams, and several guest pastors have given their time and talent to make this church what it is today. And that was uh, added by Linda Miller and Peggy Rossington a number of years ago as they were chronicling the history of the church. Uh, in the first picture, uh, actually the lower left, that's what the church looked like when it was built in 1965. It, the Bible study room was on, is now on the front of that, and uh, the sanctuary would be to the left. The marquee at the top is the marquee that was there. Uh, it was there for many years, and finally it just got to the point where it was kind of unusable, and now we have a, a bright new sign thanks to Mary McCoach and her progeny. <laughs> um, we also have in the middle, 1973, that was when the groundbreaking for the new church began, and you see the groundbreaking ceremony. There were Pastor Dukes and a number of the uh, members. Uh, then you have in the lower middle, you have a picture when they were putting the uh, metal on the roof. There was some great stories about that. But uh, that's how long the metal roof has been up there. And then you have the church as it now stands, completed with uh, two pictures, one being an aerial photograph. That was Pastor Dukes in May. Um, he was immeasurably beneficial in starting this church. And I must say that his dear blessed wife has a crown that outweighs his by at least 20 pounds in heaven. Bless that woman's heart. She was the most patient woman I've ever known. And uh, they were both uh, saints of great measure. <laughs> I met him in 1970. He had a hand. He could have barehanded first base for the Orioles if he wanted to with that hand. I never will forget that. And from 1970 until the Lord took him home, he had an enormous impact on my life spiritually. And uh, both of them were great. So there's Pastor Sai. He was the founding pastor. And there's that fellow that ha whose hair is a color I don't remember. That would have been me once upon a time. Lynn Moore, if you're not familiar with him, is here on the bottom left. Dave Rawson and Charles Williams, both uh, each of you know. There are a number of folks who were significant in the early part of the church, and these are the treasurers. The first treasurer we had was Mildred Shugard. Mildred is here, the, uh, the one that uh, says number one. Mildred was treasurer from the beginning. She was treasurer for many years, and uh, very simple, just kept a ledger 
Uh, nothing like what goes on today because in the world of <laughs> nonprofit organizations now, there, it's, a ton, it's a ton of work. Mildred kept it very simple, but very honest. And then when Mildred was no longer able, Mary McCoach, not the best picture, but for those of you that remember Mary, she's in the uh, top uh, right picture there. Mary took over. And Mary would tell the chairman just ever so often, don't spend any money until you talk to me. Because they, Richard and some of those guys had a tendency, oh, we'll get this. And she wanted to make sure that if we got it, we had the money to pay for it. <laughs> then Joanne Paley was treasurer for quite some time. Joanne just went to be with the Lord here uh, a couple of months ago and was very uh, uh, instrumental in the treasurer's job for many years. Linda Mansker and uh, Charles Williams. Mm -hmm. Others that were, Millie Charnick was uh, treasurer for about two years. Anna Washington, Marshall Meads Hunter. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the folks, these are all the ones that were treasurer. And those were the ones that were treasurer for a number of years. Uh, this is pictures of the choir. Uh, if for those of you who remember, Gloria Mood, uh, she was our pianist for a while. Phil Sabella for a, an intermediate period of time. Uh, you have uh, some of the ladies at the top there that were part of a choral group. Hmm. You had the choir as it was probably, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so. Hmm. Uh, you have a lower level area here of different ones in the choir and folks that really made a difference in the uh, worship of the church. These were some guys that have done a lot of maintenance. The guy in the middle there was Mike Lessig with the big grin. Uh, Mike and his wife, they spent probably as much time at this church as me, and I live here. Yeah. Um, and they were always doing stuff. Mike used to <clears throat> take care of the grass. <clears throat> he loved to cut patterns. He would cut a cross in the lawn so you could see it. Or he had put a big smiley face or something like that. He really took a lot of joy, <laughs> spent a lot of his own money <clears throat> making the lawn look really good. Uh, Richard Fowler is uh, to his immediate right. Richard, up into his mid-80s, spent, if I called up and said, Richard, I need you. If he wasn't beating flames in his own home, he would quit what he was doing and come up and work side by side with me. I was in my 50s. I'm in my 60s now. He was in his 80s, and I am more and more amazed day by day. <laughs> um, you have <clears throat> a number of different folks. Warren Bradley, uh, Don Strands, Don <laughs> Stout. This is John Sahaki. <laughs> this is him sitting beside Pastor Dukes. Uh, and let's see. Let me get over here where I can see a little bit better. Um, uh, you have this uh, young couple right here. Uh, that have taken over the maintenance of the lawn and a number of other things. You have Holmes Stauffer, uh, Nick Tuzo, uh, that rascal up in there, that's my brother, and then you got Joey. All those folks have uh, done a measurable work around to make God's house what it is. Uh, the founding years, these are some folks who um, were very instrumental in the beginning of this church, why it's established. Um, the top, you have Mrs. Shugard. I uh, mentioned that she was the treasurer. She was one of the ones who, when the original church was built, took a mortgage on her home so that the church could be built and uh, with, their, with their own personal homes, put those homes up. So this church could be established in Oak Orchard. <laughs> Emily Colburn, for those of you that remember Miss Emily, uh, she was a formidable lady. Uh, she was very formidable in the whole community. But she, uh, you have Mrs. Payanka, uh, number three. The lady there at number five, that's Delberta Clifton. And one of the reasons this church sanctuary that you're in now was built, they were meeting back there where what is now the uh, dining room. And there were some folks who uh, weren't sure if they wanted the church. They said, well, you know what? We still got room here. Why are we building a new sanctuary? Hmm. Pastor Dukes prayed. He said, Lord, if you want us to build a sanctuary, then let the first donation be $1,000. 
Well, that was in 1972, 1973. That was a lot of money back then. Mrs. Clifton, uh, and he didn't tell anybody he had prayed that. And uh, Mrs. Clifton asked him to come over to visit. She lived up here on the river. She said, Pastor Dukes, I believe we're going to build that church. And she wrote a check, and it was for $1,000 exactly, in answer to Pastor Duke's prayer. And he said, there are no more red lights. We're building a church. And this church stands because of that. And you have Paul and Madeline Dory. They were uh, early uh, supporters of the church as well. They have a, a various other folks here. Uh, Joe Betts, uh, many of you would not know him, but he's the reason that my family came here in the beginning. Delberta Clifton, Elva Langford, Gladys Larson, Bertha Laughlin, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Milner. Uh, he was a retired Methodist pastor. And, of course, Paula Madeline. And this is not a comprehensive list, okay? These, these are folks who uh, were here in the beginning. In the 70s and 80s, uh, we have Lynn Moore, Betty and Herman Stats, Anna Mae Rogers, Carol's mom, Calvin and Theta Miller, my parents, who then ended up coming here. We weren't here a long time. <laughs> but as you may understand, they've left sort of a lasting legacy around this place between Wayne and myself. Uh, Dave and Peggy Rossington, Rose Elliott, Avis and Aaron Williamson, Nick and Lorraine Tuzo, Paul and Irene Bowden, Elvis Short and family, <laughs> uh, Pearl Whiteson and her family. In the 80s, John and Helen Sahaki, V.C. Warrington, Mike and Marion Lessig, Richard and Ray Fowler, Don and Catherine Stout, Mary McCoach, Wayne and Linda Miller, uh, Joanne Paley, Ralph and Betty Hagee, Hilda Stott, and Alvin and Christine Griffin. And again, these are not comprehensive. These are just some of the folks that were significant. Um, Pastor Dukes had passed in 1996. Uh, uh, and about 2005, I'm sorry, in about 1995, uh, when Promise Keepers were going, that became fairly significant to the life of the church. And you have one of our Promise Keepers meeting groups there, <laughs> along with the women of faith. Uh, at one point, it was led by Carol. And you have the ladies there, uh, some of which have gone on. And then you have our mission trips. Uh, the earliest uh, mission trip, I believe, was one to Kentucky with the Appalachian Service Project. Then, um, in 1999, I believe it was, we sent a team to Guatemala. Uh, later, we sent a uh, group to Belize, and then we sent a group to Costa Rica. Those were some very interesting times. Um, and you have, uh, at the top there, it says Brazil. Hilda Stott, her, she pronounced her name Ilda because she was from Brazil and she went back on, I believe, two occasions uh, on missionary trips because her dad was a missionary there in Recife, Brazil. And I have no idea where that was. I just know it took her a long time to get there. And um, let's, uh, and also, um, I'm not sure if I see it up there. But a number of years ago, uh, Stephen Miller actually took a short-term mission trip to Japan after uh, the tsunami. All right. And uh, here are some folks that we have lost without much of an opportunity to remember them. Uh, Joanne Paley died a couple of months ago. Um, and so Joanne really didn't have any family here. She had one cousin and her mom and her husband were all buried in New Jersey. So... I went over for that service, but we didn't get a chance. And many of the folks here would remember Joanne. And she made a significant contribution to this church. The doors as you come in, uh, Joanne donated those doors as a gift to the church when her husband passed. Um, we have Bob Lewis and Flo Hall, two folks that we just did not get a chance and have not yet had a chance to have a service for. George Crashine passed about three months ago. George really uh, had a lot to do around here. <laughs> he, uh, he loved to sing. Uh, he uh, led the music for a while and was part of the choir. Helen Candler was a part of this service. Helen passed, and we have not had opportunity. And Robert Atkins passed about two years ago, actually uh, a little more than two years ago. 
uh, and Robert was an usher and a significant part of our congregation. All righty. Well, I wanted to go through that. And, you know, some folks may say, why are you doing that? Because the church wouldn't exist without these people. These are folks who were led by the Lord and moved by the Holy Spirit. Pastor Duke said one time, he said, there's about eight places to get drunk in Oak Orchard and nowhere to get saved. <laughs> and he said, we're going to change that. And by the grace of God, it did change. I'm not saying there's not a place to get drunk, but at least there is a place to get saved. And so um, with, uh, with that, I'm going to invite um, Charlie to come up and share a little bit about the Gideons so that uh, those of you that may not know will have a deeper understanding of why we choose the Gideons as our opportunity to honor these folks. Charlie? Thank you very much. <clears throat> it was quite nice to see the history of your church develop here. And uh, when I first spoke with Alan here uh, a week or two ago, um, I uh, told him that I knew Silas Dukes and the fact that he had the biggest hands of any man I've ever met. And I even met John Riggins from the Washington Redskins. That man had big hands too, but I don't know if anybody had bigger hands than Silas Dukes, and he certainly carried a lot with those hands, not only physically, but towards everybody else. He just gave us a good way to go. So I'm honored to be here today. Uh, I really am. Uh, I'm from Lewis myself. I'm a BB baby. So uh, it's nice to be here with uh, people that have uh, deep roots. Uh, my message to start out today uh, is called Spreading the Word. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be the ghost from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing which I sent it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Some days are forever frozen in their memories. Most people remember exactly where they were and what they were doing on September the 11th, 2001, when we learned that planes had crashed into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and a field in Pennsylvania. Some of us will remember where we were and what we were doing on November the 22nd, 1963, when we heard about President Kennedy's assassination. Other people remember December 7th, 1941, the day that will live in infamy. Those days are remembered because they're national events. Then there are other dates that people remember because they are personal events, a birth of a child, a wedding date, a loss of someone significant, or even the day that you gave your life to Christ. Keith Richardson shared a very personal uh, event in his life in 1970. Keith writes, we lived in Buttspock, Germany, where my father was stationed in the U.S. Army, and we lived in one of those rows upon rows of houses that were absolutely identical. Each housing unit had three stairwells, eight apartments per stairwell, which all fed down to a common area where deliveries would be made. The milkman would deliver his milk. The bread man would deliver his bread. When you woke up in the morning, you would go down and get those items belonging to you and settle up with a vendor once a month. It was a great way of doing things. That was the situation one Saturday morning when I woke up long before anyone else. And I knew better than to wake up my parents. So I had to find something to do for a couple hours. In those days, there was no American television. There was just Radio Free Europe. I looked around our living room and saw a New Testament sit laying on the coffee table. I walked up to it, picked up the Testament, having no idea how that got in our house. I thought everyone will soon be going down to the common area to pick up their goods. So I took my testament to the common area, positioned myself in a prominent place to read it so that everybody who passed by would think I was a good boy. I started at the beginning in Matthew, which was tough for me at 10 because it was full of all kinds of long and unusual names, beginning other people with even longer and more unusual names. Eventually, I came to the character named John the Baptist. He was a guy running around in the desert, dressed in a leather loincloth and eating bugs and wild honey. Well, in the 1970s, a lot of folks were doing something like that, so I kind of understood this character. Then I came to the name of Jesus. I had heard about Jesus, 
I knew that he was a good person and a teacher like Confucius. I wanted to learn more about him, so I kept reading. I came to a passage where Jesus told those who were listening, when you do your righteous deeds, beware of doing it in public so that you can be seen by other people. Don't be like those hypocrites when you pay or pray and when you give. But 10 years old, I didn't know a hypocrite from a hippopotamus, but I knew it didn't sound good. All of a sudden, I was filled with shame. I clearly remember taking the New Testament and tucking it into my jacket, hoping to make it back up to our apartment without anyone seeing me. I made it back and began to question, why do I feel this way? Why would Jesus say not to do this? Isn't reading the Bible a good thing? Shouldn't I be seen doing something that's good? And who cares about Jesus and what he thinks anyway? He's been dead over 2,000 years, right? Well, the only way I knew to answer my questions was to keep reading, so I did. I worked my way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As I was reading John 3, I came to something that was an answer to me. It was John 3, 17, which says, For God didn't send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. I came to a childlike understanding of Jesus and that He didn't come to, to uh, make me feel guilty. He came into the world to relieve me of my guilt. There's a place in the back of the New Testament where I could pray and ask that the Lord receive me and for me to receive Him. I prayed that prayer, signed my name, and wrote down the date. That was over 50 years ago. My life, destiny, and eternity were, for, for, were forever changed that day. Somewhere, there's a Gideon who gave that New Testament to someone other than me. By God's good providence, it found its way into my hands. I wonder about that, Gideon. Did he ever have become discouraged or grow weary? Did he ever know the fruit that came from his labors? But one day, I'm sure I will have the opportunity to thank him. Until that day, I'll be encouraged by Galatians 6, uh, verse 9. And let us not grow weary for, of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Pastor Keith Richardson now leads a congregation at the Barnwell First Baptist Church in Barnwell, South Carolina. Eric grew up in Sweden. He was a scholarly-minded youth and in, took most, uh, much interest in academic pursuits. I was active as a communist and I was a convinced atheist. He viewed Christians as weak, hypocritical, and fanatical. He was quite active in debate and enjoyed expressing his thoughts and seeking to persuade others towards his beliefs. When challenged uh, by a friend to read the Gospel of John, um, he agreed by saying, I will prove to you from your own book that God's not real. However, he first needed the Bible. Eric remembered that he had a New Testament that he had received from a Gideon years before in school. He searched until he found it in a drawer where it had been for all of those years. As he started to read the Gospel of John, questions became or began to fill his mind. What if Jesus is who he says he is? Soon after, he agreed to attend a Christian youth rally and some, with some friends who had invited him. And this was the very first time he had ever been to a church, or church service or had experienced prayer. He thought, God, if you're real, show yourself to me. I need to know. He writes, I experienced a strange, unfamiliar presence. I accepted forgiveness for my persuading people to doubt God over the last 19 years of my life, and I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Eric began engaging in a scripture he now loved, reading it each month through his first year as a Christian. Feeling a call to missions, Eric traveled around the world spreading the gospel, eventually ending up in Australia. Today, he now teaches at a Bible college in Sydney. The purpose of the Gideons International is the promotion of Christ to all people to the end that they may come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We are made up of Christian business and professional men, banded together in more than 180 countries for fellowship and service. Because of the Gideons, the New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs are now printed in 109 languages. 
The Testament offers help. Where to find help when you have uh, times of anxiety, uh, question, sorrow, regret, anything and everything that you would have as a, a question is found in the front of this Bible. And it gives you a chapter and verse to go to when you're hurting. Also in the back of this Testament is a prayer that's telling you that God loves you. He will always love you, never give up on you, and reminds us that we are all sinners. So there's a place in the back where you can sign your name. Put the date down that you've accepted Christ. Keep this and read this. And again, as Pastor Allen said, uh, every penny that we earn from these type of services goes directly towards buying scriptures. Not one cent goes toward administrative dues or costs. That all comes from our dues. So Pastor Allen, thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity and Gideon's the opportunity to continue to spread the word. We are truly blessed, blessed by you guys. And thank you again. And thank you all. Kayla means turn your mic back on. Thank you. Doesn't take much to get my attention back there, does it? I half gain her off that platform back there. Um, but what Gideons do is truly a calling. And uh, some of the, the guys I've known, it requires a lot. Uh, personally, you have to pay your own way. That's so the money that's given here doesn't go to support you. Um, and you have to support the, uh, the administration of Gideons on an international level. They do a remarkable job. Maybe you being called by God to be a Gideon. One of the things that we need to see is God raising up those who will take up this ministry uh, of sharing God's word. Uh, it requires time and commitment. And so I'd like to encourage you to think about that. A minute ago, <clears throat> um, Charlie used the text of Isaiah 55. And it says, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and flourish and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. What God's saying is he guarantees that when the word goes forth, it will accomplish something. You can't get that promise out of anything else. God's word is unique. It is unparalleled in ancient literature. It is by far the most attested text in all of literary history. It is unparalleled in its unity. 66 books written by 40 or more authors over a period of about 1,500 years, 1,500 years from the writings of Moses and Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, to the closing of Scripture when the Apostle Paul penned the letter uh, of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And through all those years, there is one solid scarlet thread that runs from the beginning to end that testifies that God who made us sent his son to redeem us. That thread goes all the way from Genesis chapter 3, the third page of your Bible, is a prophecy that God is going to send a Redeemer. And the last chapters of the Bible is when that Redeemer will deliver us all from this mortality and into God's heaven. It is unparalleled in its beauty and wisdom. You know, somebody once said that Jesus Christ was either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. That's the only three options. If he didn't know any better and was saying those things, that would make him the lunatic. If he was lying and knew he was not who he said he was, that makes him a liar. But if he raised from the dead... That was the evidence that he was the Lord. 
and there is the story of scripture. We call it history, his story. It is his story. It is his story from beginning to the end. And the scriptures are unparalleled. It is unique among even religious writings because of the prophecies that have been fulfilled and are being fulfilled now. It is unique in its endurance. No book on the face of the earth has withstood such attack by its distractors, by rulers, by skeptics, and by enemies. They have sought to diminish the word of God. And yet, the word of God remains forever, and it will remain forever, because it is God's word. In today's world, folks like to look at the Bible and assume that it was just the writings of ancient sages from days gone by. Well, God used those ancient people, but God's Holy Spirit is the author of the Word. And because it is God's Word and God is eternal, the Word of God will stand forever. When you think about investing, you know, Right now, it's a little scary out there if you're an investor. What are you going to invest in? Where are you going to put your money? Well, today, we have that opportunity to invest in something that God said is going to last forever. This is never going to crash. It is always going to be significant. God will use the word. He promises that he will use the word because he sends it forth. And he says, I send it forth to accomplish my purpose. And he says, when the word of God goes forth, you may think that you're too frail or too weak or too this or too that when it comes to sharing the word of God. I will tell you this, I don't care who you are, how weak you may seem or how and significant you may think you are when you put forth the word of God rightly divided that will make an impact now sometimes the impact of the word of God is actually to harden and that's a fact but when you put forth the word of God and it hardens the benefit of rightly dividing the word and sharing it goes to you the responsibility for what happens to it lays with the other person. But it's amazing how many times that the word of God goes forth and it breaks through that hardness. And people humble themselves when the Holy Spirit takes those words that he inspired, breaks through ignorance, pride, arrogance, hatred, bigotry. He just has the power to crush that. You know one of our problems right now? If all these social ills and we're trying to fix them ourselves, we're trying to fix them with government, we're trying to fix them with philosophy. You know what fixes social ills? The word of God rightly spoken. The word of God rightly spoken will bring the racist to his knees in repentance. It will bring the sexually perverse to their knees in repentance to be restored to Jesus Christ. That's what the world needs. You know, back, back in the olden days, the song, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. I'm going to tell you what, what the world needs right now is the word of God because there is no pure love on the face of this earth. Than the, than the word of God going forth. It is unique in its promises and power. God has decreed that his word will bring forth repentance, and it brings us to Christ. The power of the word is through the Holy Spirit, its author. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Honor those who preach and teach the gospel. First Peter says, honor all people. What this means is that you and I should arm ourselves. 
each Sunday when I put a verse up there and I go through it three times. I do that because the Word of God is powerful. I do it because when you repeat the Word of God, there's a real chance that somewhere down deep in your mind and in your heart that will find a place that one day God will use you to share that verse. And you may think, how in the world did I remember that? The Word of God is different, folks. It's different than anything else. And it, it's going to last forever. Kingdoms rise and fall. Except the kingdom of Christ. God said to David, he said, I will raise up a king who will sit on your throne, whose kingdom will never end. That same king, Jesus Christ, who was crucified and rose and ascended back into heaven, is going to return one day. And he is going to receive those who have come to faith in him. And the prescribed method for God's people to win others to Christ is through the Word of God. And so arm yourself and arm others with the Word. None of us are worthy. If you think I'm worthy because I'm the pastor, I got to tell you, that isn't the way it works. You see, the old saying is that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. If you're willing to hear the call of Christ, he will do the equipping. And when you are equipped with the word of God and you go out, you need to remember that the power isn't in you. The worthiness isn't in you. The power is in Jesus Christ and in his word. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, today we have honored some of those, Lord, in our church's past who have influenced us, whose faith and sacrifice and love Establish this church. And Lord, there have been countless folks that have come through these doors. Many of them are with you now. And Father, many have been sent out to various places. Uh, Father, we have folks who have uh, left this church and gone out into missions. We have got folks from this church who have moved for all kinds of reasons, but have carried what they found here the love and the grace, Father, to all parts of this country. We thank you, Father, for those that you led here many, many years ago. And we thank you, Father, for those that you have gathered to yourself who have run and won the race. And I pray, God, that you would help us to take up the mantle that they have handed down to us to run this race with the same faith that they ran it. Father, I pray for the ministry of the Gideons. And I thank you for our church's participation throughout all these years with them. Father, we will not know on this side of heaven how many lives have been changed because of what was given through this church and sent all over the world. Father, we thank you for that. We ask you to bless the Gideons and their work. We ask you, God, to supply every need they have and that you would supply Bibles, Father, for their willingness to distribute them without cost. And we ask, God, that you would bless us in this church. And we thank you, God, for those who came before us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as we close.